let's continue. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to our weekly national news conference. I'm Sandy Close, Director of Ethnic Media Services. Today, our topic is global warming, which is making headline news, especially in the West, because of an early heat wave and severe drought. Things are likely to get worse before they get better, one of our speakers told the New York Times yesterday. EMS will host a series of briefings with fellowships starting today to identify trends and sources who can help us cover climate change. Speaking for myself, I know so little in this field, I barely know the questions to ask, yet I'm aware that this is the epic story of our time. Today, we are especially grateful to our three speakers for helping us start this series. Dr. Christy L. Ebby, Professor for the Center of Health and the Global Environment at the University of Washington and co-author of a new report on the impact of rising heat on mortality. Our second speaker is Daniel Swain, a climate scientist at UCLA and author of Weather West blog. He will discuss the worsening drought. And our third speaker is Aradna Tripathi with the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, who will discuss the need for an equity approach. Thank you again. We ask you to speak slowly for our interpreters. If you speak too fast, our moderator may interrupt to ask you to slow down. And thank you to our interpreters uh, for your terrific work. We invite reporters to enter questions in the chat box, and we will take questions for each speaker and again at the conclusion of the panel. We will be sending a video of today's briefing, expanded biographies of our three speakers and relevant collateral to everyone on the call this afternoon. Now I'm turning the conference over to today's moderator and our conference co-coordinator, Pilar Marrero. Pilar. Thank you, Sandy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please uh, add your questions, ask anything that comes to your mind. This is a topic that it's so key for us to cover in the near future but many of us don't know a lot about. So um, let's start from the beginning with Dr. Christy L. Evey. She is a professor for the Center of Health and the Global Environment at the University of Washington. And she recently co-authored a report on the impact of rising heat on mortality. Uh, thank you, Dr. Evey, for being with us. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody's interest in the topic. I'm not going to show any slides. I'm just going to make a few relatively short comments so that there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. I was asked to talk a little bit about heat. And a first main point is that heat, higher temperatures kill. But almost all of those deaths are preventable. We know from heat waves, for example, in Europe in 2003, when there were 70,000 excess deaths, that large numbers of people can die in heat waves. And as I said, almost all of those deaths could be prevented. When we look particularly in the United States, if you look at the estimate of the number of people who die from heat, first conclusion is that it's the number one weather-related killer in the United States. But those numbers are underestimates. The estimates are in the several hundred people dying every year from heat. There was an analysis last year using the same kinds of methods that are, that are being used right now for COVID-19 to take a look at over the periods when you've got high temperatures, how many deaths would you expect and how many deaths actually occur. 
that analysis suggested that it's more like five and a half thousand Americans die every year from the heat. So the numbers are much larger. And these again are preventable. There's a lot that can be done to reduce that mortality. We know from the climate science that heat waves are increasing in frequency, intensity, and duration. So the concern for the future is as temperatures continue to rise, that unless actions are taken, mortality is really going to increase during the summer. The actions we can take range everywhere from making sure that people undertake activities to reduce their core body temperature. In most regions, it does not, not have to be air conditioning. People can reduce their core body temperature using self-dousing, wetting your skin, and turning on a fan that's highly effective from a physiological perspective for helping reduce your core body temperature. Heat wave early warning systems are being set up in many communities, and those save lives. They provide warnings to people of when it's going to be hotter than normal and what kinds of activities people can undertake, like I just mentioned the self-dousing. Also, looking in on your neighbors, making sure that the neighbors are doing the, the right things, as it were, making sure that they're hydrated, making sure that they do have an environment where there's good air circulation will really reduce that mortality that we don't want to see during a heat wave. The paper that was mentioned before showed that if we continue on our current track, mortality will increase significantly. It also depends not just on the temperature, but also on our development choices. What do our cities look like? What kinds of investments do we make in having green roofs, for example, in thinking about city planning so that they have greater airflow when temperatures are high? When people do use air conditioning, it dumps excess heat into the environment, contributes to urban heat islands, and everything that we can do to prevent that increase in the urban heat island means that the temperatures will be somewhat cooler, therefore easier for people to keep that core body temperature down. This is a complicated area. There's lots of different factors that I could delve into. I look forward to your questions. And I do want to make one point when we think about heat, we also need to think very clearly about the equity and environmental justice factors. We know in the United States, for example, redlining has made a significant impact in terms of the heat in particular areas. Cities like Phoenix have done a lot of work looking at what areas of Phoenix are the hottest. And they're the areas where people who are poor and marginalized live. There's fewer trees, there's less airflow, the structure of those particular urban environments are such that they tend to be hotter. And so there is an opportunity during actions to reduce heat to ensure that we also address the environmental justice aspects. With that, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions later. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ebby. Um, can you expand a little bit on um, the warming of the, uh, of the temperatures, global heat? How, can you explain that for our reporters who may need a little bit more of an understanding of how, that, that, how that's happening uh, at the moment and what's the threat there? As humans release greenhouse gas emissions, primarily through burning of fossil fuels, but also through deforestation, those additional greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap more heat. The analogy is the greenhouse effect. It's not a great analogy, but it's the one that is frequently used. And right now, the concentrations of carbon dioxide, which is the major greenhouse gas that is tracked with respect to climate change is about 420 parts per million in the atmosphere. Pre-industrial, before the industrial revolution, that concentration was 280. There's been a very, very big increase. And there was a paper published uh, yesterday or the day before 
showing in the last 15 to 20 years that the trapping of heat in the atmosphere is much more rapid than people had expected. And this is why we're seeing not only overall warmer temperatures, but again, much higher temperatures when you have a heat wave. There is a question in the chat by Jaya. Um, Jaya, do you want to ask your question? Uh, Dr. Ebby, um, the heat waves are affecting the American West um, more often and more um, right now. So how do you explain that? The interaction between weather and climate's complicated. And Dr. Swain is a climatologist. He might be able to answer this somewhat better than someone whose expertise is health. But each area of the US has had heat waves. And it is the interaction between weather patterns, which happen on you know, a few day kind of scale with the land and with the, the circulation in the atmosphere of the ocean. The earth works very hard. What our atmosphere oceans are about are moving heat around the earth. And when you start having shifts in weather patterns, you start seeing places where you can have heat waves. And of course, right now it's in the West, but the Southeast has had its share of very severe heat waves, as has the Northeast, as has the Northwest, as has parts of Canada. I can't explain this particular one, but it is a very good question. Dr. Abby, I'm gonna ask a very uh, basic question, uh, but I think it's, it's important to know, how do people die of heat? I mean, how does that happen? What, what, what kinds of exposures do you need to have in order to have a serious impact from heat and, and, and die? Our bodies function within a pretty narrow temperature range. And when it becomes hot, as our core body temperature increases, it increases the strain on our heart. It increases the strain, <clears throat> excuse me, on other organ systems. And who is most vulnerable in a heat wave depends on a wide range of factors. We don't do know that adults over the age of 65 are at higher risk. In part, that's because as people age, they become less well able to tell they're getting into trouble with the heat. We know that people who are less well fit, we know people with chronic diseases, we know people who take certain kinds of drugs that inhibit the ability of the body to sweat, all affect our reaction to higher temperatures. And heat doesn't kill instantaneously. When you see a heat wave, mortality starts within 24 hours. So heat accumulates in our body, damaging the functioning, the basic functioning of our organ systems. And once for each of us as an individual, that temperature gets too high, we start having heat stress and we can go on to heat stroke and we can die from heat stroke or we can die because we've got underlying heart disease and the strain on our heart was so high that it leads to a heart attack, for example. And there's lots of other groups I didn't mention. There's a lot of research that's been coming out recently showing that pregnant women during heat waves can have preterm births. The babies will come sooner. They may have lower birth weight babies. So the heat affects our physiology in lots of different ways. Our bodies are designed through various mechanisms, primarily sweating to get rid of that heat. And if there's any reason why it's difficult to do so, external conditions such as temperature and humidity, if we're working outdoors and we're generating a lot of heat from the work we do outdoors, underlying medical conditions, all of those can interact then with the outdoor temperature and put us at higher risk. Thank you, Doctor. Henrietta Burroughs has a question. Henrietta, ask your question, please. Thank you, Pilar. Um, since communities of color already live in areas that are more vulnerable to heat, what additional measures can be taken to protect these areas more? Now, you mentioned the planting of trees. What else can be done? 
in the short term, everybody needs higher awareness that few people understand that heat is a killer and really getting people to understand that. And that's true for everybody, but it is especially true for poor and marginalized communities. As I said before, many of these communities are structured such that they are hotter than other parts of cities. So people need to make sure they stay hydrated. They need to make sure for example, that they've got the doors and windows open, they've got fans on, they don't wear heavy clothing, that they take actions to reduce the core body temperature. If they can't do that sufficiently within their living environment, many cities have not only heat wave, uh, early warning and response systems, but they have cooling centers. And go, go to a cooling center and spend a few hours getting that core body temperature down again it becomes more challenging for people when we have very hot days combined with very hot nights, because then it's more difficult to be able to cool that core body temperature back down again. There's lists of what people can do to reduce their vulnerability to heat from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from US EPA. I can find one of those and put a link in the chat if that would be helpful. So there are a long list of activities that people can undertake and they can undertake them together. It doesn't have to be individually, but a group of people can go to a cooling center, for example, to make sure that they cool down. If there's anything air conditioned, I live in a city that's got the lowest penetration of air conditioning in the United States. Um, and so in Seattle, it's complicated because people do have to find external cooling centers. But if you've got a neighbor with air conditioning, any way that you can try and get those core body temperatures down will help protect people in the heat. I'm going to ask you a last question and then I'm going to move to the second speaker. But um, and I'm also going to ask this question of him. But where in the world uh, do we find the most impact of, of, of heat and mortality? What are the countries that are the hottest? And I ask this because we have many reporters in this call who, you know, who cover ethnic communities and who cover their uh, communities for their uh, readers in their home countries. So they'll be interested to know. One of the key misperceptions, not only people typically don't understand that heat kills, but people assume that if you live in a hot environment, you're more adapted to the heat. The highest heat related mortality in the US is in Arizona. Again, we've got a fairly narrow range physiologically within which we function. There was a large analysis that was just done looking at temperature mortality relationships around the world. It's a, it's a very large consortium. Data are available for over 700 communities, um, cities, countries. And one of the findings of that was that about a third of heat related mortality is probably due to climate change. But key is that there were almost no data from Africa very limited data from any low and middle income country. So big parts of Asia, very little data. Most of the data are from high income countries. And we don't know the answer to that because we don't actually have the data. We do know that I mentioned the European heat wave where about, about 70,000 people died in 2003. There was also a heat wave in a city in India that caused about 2000 deaths. And that's probably an undercount. So worldwide, everybody's at risk and presumably the low and middle income countries experience very high risk and we don't have sufficient data to answer your question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Evie. We're very thankful that you were here to talk to us. Um, for your interest. I'm, I'm going to invite our second speaker. Um, uh, and that is uh, Tainel Swain, climate scientist. Um, he, um, he's affiliated with UCLA, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, 
and the Nature Conservancy. And he also has a blog, the Weather West blog, that I would advise reporters to follow. It's, it's very informative. We can send a link to that blog as well to you. Uh, Dr. Schwein, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and also for the invitation uh, to join you all today. Uh, I have a few really basic slides that I'll just have up in the background. They're mostly just graphics sort of showing not much text. So hopefully that'll work for everybody. So I will go ahead and share my screen momentarily. And then as long as everybody can see that, I'll get started. I guess it's still loading up. There we go. We can see it. Perfect. I can see it. <laughs> Great. So really what I wanted to talk about today uh, was, uh, well, California uh, as a matter of geographic focus and the escalating drought that is unfolding in this part of the country, it, it is actually part of a much broader drought across the American West, especially the southwestern states of California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. So this is affecting quite a broad region. Uh, but zooming in on California right now, the intensity of the drought is extremely severe. Um, this is not just a run of the mill drought, if you will. This is a top tier drought historically. In fact, we are currently on track to surpass the severity of the last drought, which occurred back uh, around 2013 to 2016. And by many metrics, that was the worst drought uh, in California's recorded history. We're currently on track to surpass that just a few years later. Uh, and as you can see from the drought intensity map in California, um, I wouldn't necessarily take the spatial variations too literally, but what this is really illustrating is that almost the entire state is in extreme to exceptional drought. So in the, essentially the highest tiers of drought intensity that are available using this monitoring system. And what this means is that the drought impacts from a human and agricultural and environmental perspective have really escalated quite a bit over the past several months and are likely to escalate further uh, quite considerably in the coming months. Because as anybody who lives in California knows, uh, this is just the beginning of the dry season there. Um, you know, June is the very beginning of the long dry period that usually lasts from late May through at least September and in many years through October or increasingly uh, even into November. So we have at least several more months of very dry conditions to come. And based on what we're seeing right now, several more months of likely much warmer than average conditions to come, including what are likely to be a number of severe heat waves, one of which we're currently experiencing right now in many parts of the state. And as we just heard, those heat waves, I think have an outsized public health impact that has uh, largely gone um, under-recognized historically uh, and is getting some more attention now as we're starting to see significantly more of them. And I think really importantly from a public health perspective, we're seeing more heat waves that are not only more intense, but from a public health perspective, they're lasting longer. So you have more consecutive days of heat and much of the increase in temperature is actually occurring at night rather than daytime. So precisely when it was most problematic uh, in terms of a human, human health considerations. So we're seeing heat waves that are more frequent and more intense and they're warming more at night than during the daytime and they're lasting longer. And beyond the public health considerations here, as we've been seeing more heat waves, but also just more increasingly warm temperatures in general uh, in this part of the world, it means that we're seeing an increase in the uh, intensity and severity of droughts in California. And what's really interesting about this, this chart now showing the long-term trend in essentially dryness that is defined both by low precipitation but also high temperature. So drought is not just a matter of low precipitation, but increasingly it's also a matter of unusually warm temperatures because obviously you need a certain amount of water to fall from the sky in the form of rain or snow, 
it, it's also a matter of how much of that water then evaporates back into the atmosphere. So it's a water balance perspective. If your outputs are exceeding your inputs, so if your evaporation is greater than your precipitation for long periods of time, that's another way to get into a drought or to intensify a drought, a pre-existing drought. And that's in fact exactly what we've been seeing in California recently, but also in the long term. As you can see in this graph, there's more yellow, there's taller yellow spikes the closer you go to the present time. So as you go forward, there's been an increase in the severity and the frequency of drought in California. And what's really interesting is that when you look at long-term trends in precipitation, you don't see a decrease in California, but you do see an increase in the severity of drought as is shown right here. And so how can this possibly be the case? Well, it really comes down to warming temperatures, as you can see now on this chart. And really what's going on is that California, and this is true really of all the Western states, and in fact, this is probably true no matter where you are in the world right now, the climate is significantly warmer than it was even a few decades ago. And I'm just using California as the example here, but the same logic applies essentially everywhere globally. The several degrees of warming that we've seen already uh, in Fahrenheit over land in California has had a quite significant influence on the frequency and severity of heat waves, as has already been mentioned, but also in the severity of those droughts which are occurring, essentially because it's increasing the rate of evaporation into the atmosphere, even in places where the precipitation hasn't necessarily decreased. And so ultimately there's just less water available on the landscape, which means that the soils become drier, the vegetation becomes drier. It means that plants require more water that is less available. And so all of this means that not only is there less water in rivers, lakes, and streams available to humans and to the environment and to agriculture, but also it means that there is less capacity for the atmosphere to buffer against extreme heat waves. So by this, I mean, on a typical situation, you would have a atmospheric high pressure system that might bring some warm air, lots of sunny conditions, and a lot of the sun's energy would actually go toward evaporating water out of the soil rather than heating the atmosphere. But increasingly, as the frequency and severity of droughts in California and the American West has increased, and as soil moisture has decreased, there's less water available for the sun's energy to evaporate. And so an increasing fraction of that solar energy is going into heating the atmosphere and heating the ground rather than evaporating water. And that's- Dr. Swain, yes. uh, we're only seeing your first slide for oh, some reason. That's that's so strange. It's kind of it's kind of stuck there. All right, let me let me try and see if I can. Ah, uh, I see what might be going on. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, and, and we will include these slides if um, the, if the doctor agrees in our email to the oh, media of, later. of course, I'll just I'll, and I'll quickly resummarize these. But I just wanted to point okay. out that the on this map, for example, showing the, the this I guess this is a, just a California map. What I really wanted to point out was that the the severity of the current heat wave right now this week that's unfolding is maximized in the places that are most unusually dry due to the drought. So there's a clear link between the places that are most dry and that are experiencing the most extreme heat because of this connection between the soil moisture and this vicious cycle feedback between drought uh, begetting more heat, begetting more drought in this cycle that continues throughout the dry season. And so just to, just to remind folks who didn't see it initially, this chart is just showing the long-term trend in temperatures in California. It's clearly getting a lot warmer than it used to be. And this chart is showing the increase in drought severity and intensity. So the more yellow you see, the more frequent and the more intense the droughts. We've seen an increase in drought frequency and severity in California, even though we have not seen a decrease in long-term average precipitation. What's causing this? It's primarily the warming temperatures. And I think I would close by saying that these increasing severity of, of heat waves and of, of drought in the West, including the current drought, which is ex extremely severe, 
has lots of implications for wildfire conditions as well, because as you might imagine, warming temperatures and drying conditions dry out the vegetation. The vegetation, the, not just the forest, but also the grasslands and the regions in between the forest and the grasslands uh, become more flammable. And you have fires that burn at a higher intensity, are more difficult to control, and are more likely to threaten people and ecosystems. And so that's unfortunately what we're seeing right now, uh, beginning uh, in the past few days uh, in Arizona and Utah, but likely expanding northward and westward into Colorado and California and potentially the Pacific Northwest in the weeks to come. And so we've seen in our own research as well, a pretty strong trend towards increasing extreme fire weather conditions as a result of climate change, once again, because of warming temperatures and lowering humidity. And so I think I'll close there just to leave plenty of time for questions. And let me know if anybody would like to see a specific slide uh, while answering those. Yeah, and um, I think people would love to have the slides um, if you send them to us. Um, Dr. Swain, thank you for your presentation. This is a topic that lends itself to a lot of confusion. Um, you know, just in under, for people, for regular people like us uh, who are not scientists to understand um, what's going on. You just told us the problem is not that it's raining less. The problem is that the temperature of the earth is higher, right? So it's evaporating the water. This is something that I didn't even know. I thought it had to do with rain. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, people who don't understand, for example, if we see a very cold winter, you know, or a lot of rain. Hey, that proves there's no climate change. That proves there's no global warming. There's a lot of that misinformation that goes around. And there are some groups that push it and, and they're like ex skeptics of, of this issue. Um, how can we explain this warming of the earth? How can we explain all of this in a, in a simpler language to our readers? How do you tell people, hey, this is what's happening. Doesn't matter that there's a cold winter. Doesn't matter that there's rain or not. This is what's happening and this is why. In very simple terms. The big picture of what's going on globally is simply that in a world where the climate was not changing, what you'd see is that the amount of energy coming in to the Earth's atmosphere from the sun would approximately be equal to the amount of energy that leaves the Earth. So essentially, uh, the system would be in balance. And what we're seeing right now is, is that the energy coming in from the sun hasn't really changed, but the amount of energy leaving the Earth has decreased. So you can think of it a little bit like a bathtub, where you have sort of inputs coming in through the faucet and outputs through the drain, you're draining the tub. If you're filling the bathtub at exactly the same rate that you're letting the water out through the drain, then the level of water in the bathtub is not going to change. That would be the typical case state of things. But right now you can envision the tap is like the sun and it isn't really changing. The flow, the flow rate is about the same, but we've partially clogged the drain. And so the water is no longer flowing out as quickly as it's flowing in. That's the sort of the energy analogy to what's going on globally from a climate perspective. And the reason why we know that that's actually what's happening is because when we look at all the alternative hypotheses for why the world is warming, so we know that the world is warming and it could be because of other reasons, right? It might be something other than hum human emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But when scientists over a decade looked at all of those other alternative hypotheses, what else could be causing this? They found out that essentially none of those things were actually happening. And the only explanation left essentially is that what the reason why the planet is warming is because we're emitting all of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And there's a question in the chat about greenhouse gases. What are those? Well, in general, greenhouse gases are gases that um, accumulate over many decades in the atmosphere. So we emit them and they don't just dissipate. They actually sit up there for many, many years. Um, and what they do is they don't allow uh, some of that, the Earth's energy to escape back to space. So they, they act kind of as like a, 
uh, a blanket, if you will, or a, a greenhouse window. That's where the greenhouse effect uh, sort of came about, where it'll let sunlight in, uh, but it won't let all of the accumulated energy out. So it's sort of like a one-way window in that sense. It's not perfect. It's, it's, it's an imperfect one-way window, but even a small fraction of energy that gets left behind doesn't go back to space in the long run, accumulates a lot of extra energy uh, on the planet. So that's essentially what's going on. And greenhouse gases, because they accumulate to ever greater levels over time in the Earth's atmosphere, are acting like this thickening blanket or a thickening you know, wall of that greenhouse. And those greenhouse, greenhouse gases come from human activity, from burning fuel and industries and stuff like that, right? Yeah, they come from all sorts of human activities, as was mentioned in the last talk. A lot of it's from literally burning things that have carbon in them. So everything from gasoline to oil. Um, so most of our transportation, most of our electricity uh, generates a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, as do a lot of our factories. But also agriculture is very important as well, because carbon compounds can also be emitted from the soil, from livestock. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do, just about every aspect of our lives, in fact, are involved in some, some form of greenhouse gas emissions. You said in the New York Times that the things will get worse before they get better. How do you see things getting better? Well, I think that quote was in reference to this summer specifically. So the things will get better uh, part of this, uh, I would say with high confidence is it will eventually be winter again. It will event by next winter, it won't be summer anymore is essentially what I meant by that. Um, so there's, there's, you know, there's some room for optimism there. Of course, we've had some very dry winters recently, which haven't offered much relief. So that's, um, there's a limited silver lining there, but I think you could also extrapolate it as well um, to climate change, because I, I am optimistic that we're beginning to take it seriously. But I think the challenge there is that we have, we, we're just still not doing today what we would need to do to really solve the problem. So while I'm optimistic that we'll get there eventually, in the meantime, there could be pretty big problems that come up. We're already starting to see some of them now. But even if we start taking climate change very seriously and eventually bring global carbon emissions to zero in the next couple of decades, there will still be at least a couple more, probably a few more decades of significant additional warming increases in extreme heat waves and in droughts and in all of these things that we've been talking about. So in the meantime, we are going to have to adapt to this new climate reality. And in that sense, um, that too would get worse before eventually uh, it gets better. And, and the, what I hope is the optimistic scenario that we do solve the underlying problem. We do hope we get to that part. The optimistic part. Thank you so much. And I'm going to invite our third speaker, and that is Aratna E. Tripathi from the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Thank you. Uh, you know, I want to uh, touch on some points made by the, the first speaker um, and also by the second speaker. Uh, and also add to them. I wanna highlight we're already paying a price for climate change. There are children who lost parents, grandparents, um, parents who lost their children during Hurricane Katria, Katrina, Maria, during the fires in paradise. There were people who had to leave the communities they were part of in different parts of the world because of the impacts of climate change. So we're already experiencing it. And the people that are impacted they will bear scars from that for the rest of their lives. But also when it comes to addressing climate change, what we see from climate models is that the issues are gonna become more severe. They will also, as we know from COVID-19, any injustices that exist will interact with other inequities in ways that will be particularly devastating for low-income communities, communities of color. Some can afford to just simply move. They may have multiple homes, but that is not everybody. It's in fact not most people. So we have to work to address and mitigate climate change in ways that are equitable so that they don't, that the events that happen don't perpetuate inequities for us and for future generations in ways that are, are really devastating. I also want to highlight that when it comes to climate change, there aren't effective solutions unless equity is baked in from the beginning. 
we have to have solutions that are built from the grassroots up, from the community up, when we think about climate mitigation. That really is what needs to be done to be realistic about community climate adaptation if we want to protect our communities from environmental and climate disaster. There needs to be this emphasis on just transitions where we do more than just you know, um, disseminating information to community members or acknowledging barriers that they face, but really centering the community in solution building and in decision making. We have to have solutions that leave communities with capacity. We have to have anti-displacement solutions that put health and equity at the forefront. And so let's look at a few kind of specific examples of policies that can underpin equitable uh, uh, development of climate climate mitigation strategies. So we know our nation's becoming a country of color and we have large ethnic and language diversity, but if we want to enable communities of color to participate in climate change policy, our weather and climate services, various things that we do need to be done in multiple languages. We also have to look at who has power and control over decision-making. For example, are there policies that support community assemblies that let people shape what happens in their communities to mitigate climate change? You know, there, are there green spaces in cities that so many community organizers have been asking for for decades? We see right now that there are large disparities in where there is green space, but the first speaker talked about these heat waves and the, you know, the impacts on mortality rates. Well, a team of students working with me showed that in Los Angeles, it can be 15 degrees Fahrenheit cooler when we have heat waves in the wintertime and much cooler in the summertime if you have tree shade. But most communities of color are asphalt and concrete in LA, while white communities have much more shade. Excuse so me, you need to slow down a little bit for translator, for the interpreters, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Okay, thank you. So, so parks are not just a social justice issue, but they in fact are a climate justice issue. And the presence of green space that communities have been asking and advocating for, they actually have a cooling effect, but they also can help with water, they can be spaces for gardens and local food. And so they can address a number of interconnected justice issues. Another example of policies that can help with equitable engagement relate to the centering of indigenous peoples in giving back land, at granting land rights, and in preventing development in tribal lands. What we're seeing now is in the local, state, and federal level, uh, and at the corporate level, many of the practices that we're realizing are needed are ones that are regenerative, they're centered in conservation, they're centered in sustainability, but most indigenous practices are exactly this. So we need to ensure we actually support indigenous sovereignty and that we don't just appropriate their practices, but we partner with tribal authorities on land and water management in the face of climate change. We also have to look at with policy who gets resources for doing the work. The New Green Deal is being implemented, for example, in LA, folks are thinking about it at the state level, federal level, who will be paid to implement this? Will these be minority owned businesses that are employing people from communities as we implement the green transition? That has to be done for it to be equitable. And then specifically, you know, we hear a lot in industry about electric cars, but how do we ensure that most people can access these? Most people can't pay for a new car. So what about electric car conversion kits so anybody can modify their car and then people can be trained up in communities to do this? For solar, is it just gonna be on rooftops in wealthy areas or will there be community distributed solar so that it's affordable in both urban and rural areas? For water, what about access? Is it clean? and free or at least affordable. Otherwise, what has been devastating the Navajo Nation, what's been devastating Flint, so many communities of color as those water stressors because of drought that Daniel was talking about, as that you know, continues to grow, who's gonna be most impacted as water rates go up and as we have access to less and less clean water. And then when we think about you know, policy that's been implemented already, there can be unintended consequences of well-intentioned policies. When we look at uh, the devastation after Katrina or the, the fires in Paradise and Chico, where is FEMA money going? A lot of that money is going to rebuilding mansions, you know, rebuilding homes for wealthier people, but where is the low-income housing? 
right? Who is getting displaced? So if you look at cap and trade, what we also see in California where this has been implemented is that um, facilities that are paying to be able to emit, they are sometimes then emitting other pollutants in communities of color. Um, carbon offset projects are often displacing indigenous peoples. So, you know, we really need to bake equity in from the ground up if these policies are going to be implemented in ways that don't exacerbate existing inequities. So then concretely, what does that mean? It means we have to have power shared in spaces where policy is proposed and where decisions about climate policy are happening. We need to have leaders of color, youth leaders, community leaders in, power make, in, in policy making spaces. We can have youth and community leaders on air resources boards. We can have community environmental justice leadership boards at the city, county, state, and federal level that are vetting policy. LA has its first climate emergency mobilization office, but is this gonna really be done in the right way where it's used to also vet environmental justice and climate policy? Do we really have the people that are needed with a seat at the table? Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much um, for that presentation. And um, in a little bit, I will ask a question uh, from all the speakers whoever is still around. But for now, um, let's see if we have questions for you in the chat. Um, oh, um, we've, we've heard a lot about the potential you know, establishing of a national climate service, like we have a national weather service. Uh, that has been nixed in the past by Congress and you know, it has been postponed forever. It seems it's been reconsidered now. Would that be a thing? Would that be, you know, we, we can access a service that tells us how the climate is doing? Will that be helpful? Yeah, so there's discussions happening again right now at the federal level. There have been some recent congressional hearings on this. I was part of a National Academies um, board. We had a series of panels where we were discussing this just in the last two weeks, what a national climate service might look like. Um, and so right now there's discussion about if this is implemented, how this needs to be done equitably. This needs to be done with some of the um, principles that I've described, for example, having community leaders helping to steer it, making sure it's accessible in multiple languages, but also so it's not just about information dissemination, but it's also about co-creation of strategies with community experts, right? So, so that it's really going in, uh, in both directions. So yeah, I think this is something that the current presidential administration, the current Congress will, will likely look to, to push forward. They're certainly actively talking about it right now. Uh, Amar Gupta, do you wanna ask that last question? I think that's very important, or you want me to ask it? Amar? I lost the question, where did I put it? Hold on. Yeah, about oh, the, you know general, how Okay, yeah, I have it here. So in general, all of the things uh, mentioned in your talk uh, about power, water, heat wave, also vehicles is probably as a result of commercial misuse more than residential. How can we check that? And uh, a further question to that would be, what can we as a you know, community do about that? That's, yeah, thank you for that. So you're completely right. These are structural issues that uh, have roots in the very way we live our lives. They're impacted by the way our economy is set up and commercial sources, um, industry sources, they're by far the largest. This So this is why uh, talking about these issues, disseminating these issues, the media, ethnic media services have such a huge role to play in activating and empowering people. Um, but getting people to talk to community members, advocate to local policymakers, um, and advocate, 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 you know, change happens at a local level. So talking to policymakers, who you vote for makes a difference. But it's not just when you vote, it's also all the times in between engaging them. Um, that's really kind of of critical importance because what we need is regulation. And the only way that green regulation is gonna come through is you know, if we have people that are calling for it. That's the reason why President Biden, I think has been 
as responsive as he has been to this point, but we're going to only see Congress follow through, you know, if we're all utilizing our voices. Um, so I think really, yeah, calling for regulation um, is really critically important, but also calling for community investment because commercial mis commercial misuse, you know, an easy thing then to do is to just put polluting facilities in low income communities, communities of color, and that's not a just transition, right? So we need to have just transitions. Checking that is using your voice, engaging with policymakers, engaging in collective action. Um, I think that one thing what one can do is actually create citizen assemblies, community assemblies to bring people together to talk about these issues and then use voices collectively to send a mandate out to your local city council, your local mayor's office, and to, to other representatives. Thank you so much. And I don't know if Dr. Abby and Dr. Swain are still with us, but I really want to pose a question um, to them that will be helpful for reporters. What should we be reporting in terms of trends? What would you want us to do as journalists? Uh, what, what story will you focus on, Dr. Abby? That's a very good question. And there's so many opportunities in this space for stories. And I do emphasize the word stories, that understanding basics about climate science is really important and it's insufficient. People have to understand that it's affecting their health and their well being, the health and well being of their family members, of their colleagues, of their neighbors and that there are lots of opportunities to make a difference. A few years ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published one of a series of special reports. And the first conclusion was every action matters. We do need national policy. We do need state policy. I, as an individual, can undertake a whole range of actions. That help, that help contribute to both reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and to helping ensure that vulnerable populations and vulnerable regions are protected in the way they should be. When we think about climate change, there's two main policies. One's called mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The other is adaptation, which is prevention for our, our citizens, for our communities. So understanding that heat kills is important, understanding that climate change is increasing the frequency, intensity, duration of heat waves is important, but equally important is what can we all do so that we can create the future we would like to have for ourselves, our families, and our colleagues. Thank you so much. Um, Daniel Swain, suggestions? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would add to that and to say that i mean obviously i'm partial to you know making sure that everybody has a really good handle on what's going on from a physical science perspective the heat waves how greenhouse gases work why the planet is warming what the implications are for 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 different systems but i actually think that on the media side i think one of the things that would be great to see more of it are stories about how this is actually affecting individual people and individual communities, because I think that, um, I think the gap, and, and, and the data shows this, that there is a, a pretty wide gap between people who correctly realize that climate change is real and a problem, and those who realize that it's affecting them and the people they care about, not just you know, quote unquote, other people, which is often the perception that, well, yes, climate change is real. It's a problem that I'm okay. That's, that's, that's someone else's problem. And so there's this interesting gap in, in public perception of um, the reality of climate change as a, as a physical thing and the impacts of climate change in a very t intangible way for, for individuals and communities. And so I think linking those two things is something the media can really do uh, in a very direct way and in a very constructive way. So it would be great to see more of that, I think. And if possible, could I add something to those excellent remarks? Yes. There's some recent research 
there's a group in Yale that does regular surveys of the opinions of the American public about climate change. And one of the recent surveys pointed out that two thirds of the American public agree the climate is changing. More than 50% are worried about their health. And when you go through, there's a very high level of concern, awareness, commitment to make change. And then there was a question that asked people, how often do you talk about climate change with your family, your friends, and your colleagues? It was only about 30%. So people are concerned about this topic and you as journalists, if you can help facilitate those discussions, getting people to talk about climate change is the way we're gonna build the political will that we, we need so that we have the policies in place to protect our citizens. That's an excellent point. Aradna Tripathi. Yeah, I really think exercising the power of convening is so critical. It's a chance for people to talk, talk about these issues. I'm gonna put a link in about how to create a citizens assembly um, from the Sortition Foundation. I'm um, in the link. I want to emphasize, yeah, storytelling is critically important. I just shared two videos of two young women, one from LA, one from San Diego, who've dealt with environmental health issues, talking about the impacts that this has had really on them. Um, what, you know, I think the story that hit me very hard was a piece on NPR about two years ago after the, the Paradise Wildfire, a story about how a child that had uh, lost their parents during the fire, they were suddenly started going back to school and they were seeing a school counselor, but they didn't, they were so young when this happened, they didn't have the words to fully express the anguish they were going through. And I thought to myself, what are the scar, you know, this, this person is gonna carry scars for the rest of their life. And now when we look at the frequency of these events, the fact that in, a country like the US or in countries elsewhere that we can have tens of millions of people get impacted by these events in any one year. You know, what does that mean when that happens year after year? You know, and then it starts to come back and haunt some of the same communities that just get impacted time and time again. That's actually what can result in the entire, you know, um, just really, it, it can result in an entire community fragmenting and being destabilized, right? When so many people get hit so many times. And so that really is what broke my heart was hearing that, that story. Um, and so I think there's power in talking about the stories, but I also think looking at the record from history, you know, what we see is that climate change has happened in the past, but those changes have been much smaller typically, and they have not occurred as frequently or as quickly. And when it's happened over the last 2000 years, what's happened is that people have had to migrate. There's been social strife. There's been food scarcity and water scarcity, places like in China and India when the monsoon has failed or East Africa. And it's also been true in, you know, in Turtle Island in the US and Mexico, communities have been impacted. Communities have had to be abandoned. And so, now the scale of the changes that are occurring during the next 10 years are gonna be much bigger than that, right? And can we really afford that social cost, that economic cost, that human cost? So I think sharing the, the what history shows us, you know, and the really human stories of impact are, are of critical importance. Thank you so much. Sandy, you wanna say goodbye? Yes, uh, thank you. I just want to say what a illuminating seminar you have given us all, truly. And you made us feel like even if we didn't know a whole lot, that we can get on this learning curve and create the news and storytelling that will promote the conversation about this topic. So I have a million questions but I have one very uh, heartfelt thank you uh, for your time and for your expertise. I hope you will become 
the founders of a pool of sources for us in this field that we can return to again. Thank you. Thank you very much.